Okay, great. All right, so I'd like to welcome all of you here. So glad that you all came to our class today. My name is Denise Pinard, and I'm a volunteer with the UC Master Gardeners of Monterey, Santa Cruz, and San Benito counties. I'd like to welcome you all to today's program on basics of rose care. Before we get started, though, we are going to do the usual, let's get our uh, Zoom all set up appropriately. I think everybody's pretty used to keeping our microphone off, so I appreciate that, make sure that that is off. And we ask if you also could keep your video off. It helps our program run more smoothly, and it's just a little less distracting for everybody. Um, we found that to get sort of the best bang for your buck, if you use the speaker view, you'll get a really great view of all these great slides and all the information that you're going to be seeing today. You're welcome to ask to ask questions anytime during the program. Just go ahead and put them in the chat and we'll keep track of them. And then at the end of the presentation, uh, we'll answer all of those and make sure that uh, you get uh, the information you want to have. So I believe that we have our, well, we may not have it. I'm going to go ahead and see if we can get our live script button going um, so that you can get those closed captioning. You'll be able to see it when it's there down at the bottom of the screen. Um, for any technical questions, you can chat directly with me. Um, and in case you just miss a moment or something, uh, not to worry because we'll send a copy of the slides and the link to this video that we're making today uh, to your email, the one you use to sign up for the class uh, within just a few days. So you'll have all the information at hand. Alrighty. So for anybody who's not familiar with the UC Master Gardeners, um, we are a program that uh, has been helping home gardeners since 1980. We're all volunteers. We work in partnership with the Agricultural and Natural Resources Division of the University of California. We all receive uh, comprehensive training, and our mission is to provide outreach and research-based education on horticulture, pest management, and sustainable practices with, uh, in our local communities and to any home gardeners in, that, in, in our communities. Righty. So we're going to move on to our instructors today. So um, we have our first instructor is Deborah Stone. She's been a master gardener since 2016. She lives in the mission city of San Juan Batista, located in San Benito County. And after retiring, she became a part-time interpreter with, for San Juan Batista State Historic Park and really fell in love with the history and with the gardens there. Suzanne Cook became a master gardener in 2022. She moved to California the year before, in 20, well, not in 1921, in 2021. <laughs> Most of her experience growing roses is from her time living in the Arizona desert. She currently lives in Mid Valley in Carmel. All righty. So ladies, I'm gonna turn this over to you now, Deborah and Suzanne, there you go. All right, hi, um, good evening. So most of you probably um, have some experience with roses, but um, because we don't know what uh, people's backgrounds are, I'm gonna go through some of the basics first. We're gonna cover pruning, why we prune, what roses need to thrive, uh, discuss rose diseases and pests, beneficial insects, um, and the joys of roses. And next. So first we're gonna uh, talk about uh, the types of roses. The one that most of us are most familiar with are hybrid teas. They are the most popular, although they're growing less popular. Um, they are those beautiful roses that we see in the store on Valentine's Day. They're long stems. They have usually um, multiple um, upwards of 20 to 40 uh, petals per uh, blossom, a single blossom on a stem. Uh, they're, as I say, the classic rose. And most of us prune um, roses as though they're hybrid teas. And so that'll become important later. Next slide. So floribunds are a cross of hybrid teas with sort of an old fashioned, more wild rose, uh, polyanthas. Um, they, this really growing hugely in popularity because um, 
there are, instead of just that single uh, rose on a stem, there are clusters of roses um, branched at the ends of long stems. And um, the flower itself often resembles a hybrid tea or maybe a little bit more complex. Um, and these can be pruned very similarly to hybrid teas or can be done a little bit differently. And we'll talk about that later. So the grandifloras people may not be as familiar with. Um, they're, these are large roses. So they're a cross between the hybrid teas uh, and the uh, floribund roses. They tend to be very tall, um, upwards of six feet, can get to eight feet. Um, they have the same beautiful strong flowers of the hybrid tea, but have more flowers kind of in between um, the floribunds and hybrid teas. And they get pruned very similarly to the hybrid teas. Uh, in addition, um, there are some other roses that we didn't have slides for um, that you may be familiar with, uh, the David Austin roses, which have that very complex, old fashioned kind of French rose. Um, there are climbing roses, which can be any of these groups of roses. They just have a habit that you let them grow very long and they need to be trained up along a fence or a wall or something. Uh, the shrub roses, uh, which many of us use in um, sort of distant landscaping, instead of having a single uh, plant that you want to be the focal point, if you have a hedge, if you have an area that you want covered with flowers, then the shrub roses are ideal for that. They tend to bloom most of the summer, most of the spring and summer, and are covered with blossoms. Um, there are some other more obscure types of roses, but we won't cover those today. So pruning roses, why do we do it? Um, the main reason we do it is to improve the health of the plant and to reduce diseases. But in addition, of course, we want them to look nice. Um, so how do we do that? So first, what are the tools we need? So for me, there in this picture, they have the short gardening gloves. There are something called rose gloves, which are, <laughs> if you have, delicate skin you might want to think about investing in, uh, gloves that just have a big gauntlet of leather or of plastic or just some material to protect your arms uh, because a lot of roses have really significant thorns. Uh, then you're going to want your little hand pruners, um, some heavy duty loppers because roses can get pretty thick and you want also sometimes to not get your hands in there to avoid those thorns. Um, so I find that I will cut even things I don't need, small branches with the loppers instead. And then old roses, um, and in an areas like this where they grow most of the year, can develop really thick stems and really thick trunks. I mean, so uh, the stem might be an inch and, ve and very woody on very old uh, plants. And at some point you may wanna take those out to replenish the growth in that area to revitalize the plant. And a pruning saw can be really helpful in that situation. So there are two times that we prune. So the major pruning that most of us think about, and I think many of us are intimidated by, is winter pruning. Because we hear all these things about, you know, cutting to an outside bud and blah, 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 you know, cut this much, two thirds, a third, and this type of rose. Um, so first I'm going to say there really is no wrong way to do this. There are definitely better ways, um, but if all you do is go in and cut your roses to uh, 24 inches or 18 inches straight across, that works. Um, we're gonna go through what is a best practice, what are the better ways to do this. So in winter pruning, the idea is to um, first remove all the dead and dying canes. And then you want to thin all the weak canes. And anything that's defined as a weak cane is smaller than a pencil, uh, thick, so width. Um, we'll worry about the pruning uh, type later. Uh, next slide. And so what well, we'll go through now. So the correct way to cut, when we say cutting to an outside bud, uh, we want to cut at a 45 degree angle, about a quarter of an inch above the bud. And the, when we say an outside bud, this is particularly true for hybrid teas. We're trying to get a vase shape 
for the plant. So we want it to have a open center so that all the light gets in. We reduce the amount of disease that can be there. And we want eight to 10 canes. And when we cut those to their final height, we want an outside bud facing towards the outside of the vase. And this would be how you would cut it. Next slide. Um, so after I've cut the dead wood out, I've cut those little suckers. And I have to be honest, the first thing I usually do is if it's a really big bush and I know I'm going to take it down to about 24 inches, but it's four or five feet, I just do a big cut so I can see what's going on in the plant. Um, and then I do the finer points. So then I, I take this out and I look for suckers. So suckers are coming out of the roots. So what I should say is that most roses that you'll deal with, not all of them, but if you buy them at your local nursery, most of them will be grafted onto rootstock. And when you plant them, you have planted above that graft line so that um, everything that grows out is from that graft and not the rootstock. Suckers come off the rootstock and you can often tell that because the leaves will look a different color um, if you let them completely grow. So if it comes up near the bud, but comes up underneath it, it'll have a different flower, um, usually a wild type rose. So a simple flower with just a few petals instead of the rose you're looking for. So for suckers or for anything that's coming up below that graft line, you want to take it out, not just snip it, but take it all the way down to um, where it's originating. And so in that case, in the roots, you sometimes have to dig fairly deep um, to get it out and you wanna cut it right at that root line so it doesn't encourage it to grow again. Uh, next slide. Um, sorry, you're gonna hear my dogs in the background. Um, so again, this is that ideal form for the hybrid tea. Um, for some of our other roses, flower buns in particular, um, we don't, it doesn't have to have quite that nice a vase shape. You still want eight to 10 strong canes, um, but you can have one or two coming up in the center. What you really want is evenly spaced, um, good aeration, um, because those are gonna look uh, a little, they're gonna have more growth on the top of the plant because um, they have so many small branches. So they look um, much more complex towards the upper, you know, a few inches of maybe six inches of the plant because it, that's where all the blossoms. So they have all these fine branches. And so you'll be cutting that back um, to reduce the, maintain the height normally and also to reinvigorate the plant. Um, cutting it back severely. So some people will prune to a foot, um, particularly if they're looking for roses. Here, about here is yearly per plant. When you do that, it will send out fewer blossoms, but those blossoms will be bigger. Uh oh, I'm getting internet is unstable. Are you able to hear me? Yes, we can hear you, but you might want to just turn off your video. Okay. Sorry, this is where I'm not very good. Got it. Okay. There you um, go. So uh, again, if you want really prize block blooms, you cut it back severely, you'll have fewer, um, but they'll be big and what you would take to a show. If you want to have a lot of blossoms, you don't care about the size, you might prune back even less than a third, particularly in something like a floribund, you can, might only take a quarter of them off. If you're, if you're happy with the size of the plant, um, for me, a lot of times I'm taking more off because my floor buns have gotten so big that I can't get through the walkway. So I take them back by half um, just so that next year I can still use that walkway. Um, after you uh, have gotten the, the shape you more or less want, you wanna make sure that you don't have um, branches that are facing inwards in the hybrid tees. Um, because again, you, there you need really good air circulation. You also don't want branches that uh, cross and rub. So just take out the weaker of the two branches that are rubbing or the one 
in the position that you know you have something nearby that kind of duplicates that shape. Uh, next. Um, so in this area, uh, I don't think we have a lot of problems with bore, but depending on where you are, you might. So you'll know if you have cane borers, if you cut the uh, stems and you come back and you see little holes drilled through and they are an insect that the larva bores down and can go down many inches uh, into the cane and actually do a lot of damage. Uh, if you have those in your area, you want to seal uh, anything, again, that's larger than a pencil that you have cut um, with either commercial sealer, um, household uh, glue, or I used wood glue as well. Um, you want to make sure you clean up all the debris. You take, um, if you can, most of the leaves or all of the leaves off your plant. You're trying to reduce the ch chance of transmitting, particularly fungal diseases, which we have a lot of here, uh, to next year's um, uh, foliage. So um, I also don't compost mine. I, I put it in the green trash because um, one, the thorns don't decompose very well. So, um, and also if your compost doesn't get up to temperature, you're again, have the risk of transmitting disease that you don't want uh, back to your roses. So we'll review the, the steps. So as I say, the first thing I do is just cut it back to not the height that I want it, but a couple inches beyond that, just so I can really see what I'm dealing with. Um, start by taking out any dead wood, dead canes, uh, open up the center, remove those thin kind of straggly growth, uh, then prune the remaining canes to the height you want. Again, looking for a bud that's facing outwards. Uh, clean up and then think about feeding your roses. So the times to prune uh, in the winter are when your roses go dormant. Here they don't go dormant or depending on where you are, they may not go completely dormant. So they may not lose their leaves on their own. And so you just wait till they really sort of start to slow down. Um, and then January is ideal, February. By March, mine are already starting to um, send out some growth, but if you've waited till now, any time can be rose pruning time. Um, the other, uh, let's see, what was I? Oh, that we are going to have um, a, a hands-on workshop Saturday um, for anybody who's interested in getting some hands-on experience. Um, seeing some demonstrations of pruning different types of roses, and that's this Saturday in San Juan Batista. And I think Deb will talk a little bit more about that um, next. Okay, so summer pruning. We call it summer pruning, but it's really pruning any time uh, that you're not doing your big pruning, and it's really deadheading. Um, so the standard, particularly again for hybrid teas, is to cut to the the first um, block, the first leaves um, next to the blossom will be three per little stem. Uh, and the next sets will be five leaves. And you want to go to at least the first uh, branch or the first point with five leaves and cut below that. Floribuns are a little different because again, they're all coming up. There might be say six or eight blossoms for um, coming from a main stem. Uh, often the, the central blossom will bloom first. And so if you cut back to the five leaves, you will potentially take um, some of the areas that are gonna bloom away. So what I do is I just cut that main central one when it starts to fade. And usually the rest of them bloom very close to the same time. And then once they're all done, then I can go down and just deadhead all of them at once, which makes it a lot easier. Because if you cut each individual one, it's a huge amount of work. They have a lot, a lot of blooms. Um, and the climbers, I try to deadhead. It's a lot of work getting up on ladders. So sometimes those are ones where, you, you know, it might be a little harder. Um, but ideally, if you can deadhead them, you're going to reinvigorate the growth. Uh, next slide. So taking care of our roses. So like everything else, some water, fertilization, 
and maintenance. Um, during the summers in our coastal climate, uh, usually you're getting them about once a week to a depth of eight to 12 inches is adequate. Um, if you have very sandy soil, you may need to water a little bit more. Uh, traditionally, roses are thought of as having very deep roots um, and so can be trained to a little less frequent water um, because they will develop a deep root system. Some of the more commercial rootstocks um, are not as deep as the old roses used to be. So I think you may find you still need to water them more frequently if you've got sandy soil um, or it's you know extra hot. Uh, you definitely want to try drip irrigation. They do not like having their um, leaves wet. Uh, it can spread disease. Um, it also is, you know, so you save a lot of water if you're on drip. Um, occasionally on sunny mornings, it's a great idea to give them a hard spray just to remove the dust, you know, disease. Um, and uh, But you want them to be able to dry before evening because um, that will, if they stay wet, um, that will lead to disease as well. Uh, next. So mulching, mulching here is great. It uh, helps retain the moisture, um, keeps down the weeds, uh, wood chips, straw, grass clippings, uh, anything um, that you have that works as a mulch, if it's organic um, and it breaks down slowly, it will use nitrogen to break down. So you might need to give a little extra fertilizer um, when you use a mulch that breaks down quickly. Um, you don't want to cover the crown. You want to keep the mulch a couple inches away um, from the base of the rose, because uh, again, that's where disease and, and pests can live. And next. Um, so fertilizing. Um, you definitely want to fertilize well after you've um, done your first, your win winter pruning. Um, if you've done it early and it's going to be a while for growth to take effect. Um, so let's say you fertilized, or I'm sorry, you uh, pruned in early January. I might wait a couple of weeks to do my fertilizing if I'm behind schedule and I've not done my hard pruning until middle of February. I definitely want to get on uh, putting that fertilizer on. Um, of course, um, if you're in an area with a lot of frost, you want to delay that fertilizing a little bit because you don't want a lot of nice plump green growth. Um, to get killed by frost. Uh, general purpose, you know, equal parts 10, 10, 10, or 6, 6, 6, um, with some of the micronutrients um, spread in the amount that the um, instructions come uh, around the, away from the crown, about six inches, and then work it into the area. Think of it sort of like a drip line, um, as you would with um, any other plant. So work it within that area. Um, the truth is most roses now bloom sort of, and we say they're continual bloomers, but they're really not. What they do is they bloom in multiple uh, successions. So a couple, three, four weeks apart. Um, and if, so if you really want perfect roses, you actually time your fertilizing based on how often they bloom. I, I don't do that, it's, that's too hard. Um, so I just uh, try to fertilize again a couple of times. June and August in our area are good times. Um, if you're in an area, again, that gets pretty cold, you want to, in the fall, kind of taper off um, because you don't want a lot of uh, green, a lot of nitrogen, green growth um, to get damaged. Uh, next slide. Uh, so in the fall, um, high potassium just help the roots, um, help with winter hardiness. Um, in the past, I have to admit, I have used Epsom salts. And as I became a master gardener, I did a little research on it. And um, as it says here, there's actually no research to demonstrate it does any good. Um, so you can save that step. That's a lot of extra work. Uh, next slide. Ah, so um, I'm going to pass it over to Deb. Um, she's going to talk about the diseases and um, things that or what you could do this Saturday as well. Very good. Thank you, Suzanne. That was great. Appreciate that. Um, I want to talk about some of the diseases. We don't have, I don't 
we're not going to talk about all of them, but we're going to talk about a few things that you may be familiar with, but there's some great resources, references in the end of the presentation that you might find helpful in pulling up things that you are looking at. We also have a hotline, a Master Gardener hotline, where you can take a picture and send it in, or on Saturday, bring it with you in, in a bag, in a, in a um, freezer bag, so we can look at it and um, we'll try to identify it for you. So one of the things you often see, um, and I do see this at the park at San Juan Batista State Historical Park, we have six acres there. We have many different uh, rose, roses there. We have um, vines, we have shrubs, we have tea roses. And so when you, if, if you've signed up to come on Saturday or decide you wanna come on Saturday, you'll get a chance to really look at the different roses and, um, and then some of the conditions that they're in. Some are very old roses for many years, for almost 20 years, some of the roses weren't being watered and there's no, and they weren't being fertilized uh, and they still survived. Roses are pretty hardy. Um, it's amazing that they will, they will just continue doing the best they can under the conditions, but we certainly wanna give them the best conditions so that not only, as Suzanne was saying, it prevents diseases, um, and um, but also that they're beautiful and they continue to bloom. Black spot is um, is a fungus that requires free water to produce, uh, reproduce and grow. Um, so it's really important that when you water your roses that overhead watering is not recommended. If you can do drip at all, that's great. That's kind of the way to go. Um, because if the water stays on the roses for longer than, longer than seven hours, you could develop a uh, black spot and it's pretty tough to, to, to um, get rid of. Um, of course, if, uh, if you're gonna do it, you always do, do it in the morning. If you're gonna water them overhead, again, drip is always better. You wanna be sure that there's good uh, circulation to prevent black spot, which means that you don't wanna plant your roses too close together. You want them um, uh, enough so they can breed and get air, good air circulation. So pruning, as Suzanne, Suzanne spoke about, is critical on really opening up that, that rose bush and letting it breathe and you're letting it get sun. Location, 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 where you put your roses is really important. I think a lot of the disease that I'm seeing at the park is from roses that are sitting in the shade of a tree or that were planted in a location that might have had sun at one point in time, but the sun is now dissipated because of shade of, of other plants. So. Um, as Suzanne also mentioned, it's really important that you remove all the fallen leaves when you're pruning and um, any infected um, leaves. And then you can use, you know, we always want to try to use uh, some organic way of preventing black spot. You can't always get rid of black spot once you have it, but you can try to prevent it by using fungicides and neem is a good organic um, option for that. And you can also, if you haven't planted your rose yet, you wanna look for um, cultivars that are disease resistant. Um, and then I think more than anything, when you are pruning, be sure that you spray your, your pruner with uh, rubbing alcohol. We usually just put it in a spray bottle and spray it so that if you go from one plant to another, you're not, you're not um, going to contaminate um, uh, and, and spread the disease. Next slide. How do you mildew? Now, um, I see a lot of this at the park and some of you may be very familiar with this. Powdery mildew does not need to have free water on the plant in order to develop. You'll see it in the summertime. It's, uh, it's pretty recognizable. It's on the top of the leaf, it's on the bottom of the leaves, it's on the stem of the leaves, it's on the stalk of the leaf, it's everywhere on the plant. If you can prevent it from spreading, that's where you wanna try to do it before because once you get it, it's kind of hard to deal with, but you want to prevent it from happening. Um, again, location, 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 making sure that the, the rose is in a sunny location, making sure it gets lots of space, uh, not growing into another plant and it's, it's pruned so it gets a lot of airflow. Next slide. You can um, take care of powdery mildew by washing it off in the a.m. And then we say in the a.m. because if you try to wash it in the afternoon or late evening, you will, um, it will not dry and that'll be, a, that'll be an ongoing problem. So always wash it off in the early morning. I'm not saying five o'clock in the morning, but if you're an early riser, that's great. Uh, wash it off in the a.m. pruning. Um, again, collect all the dead leaves and dispose of it. Do not put it in your compost. 
be sure that you put it in the trash so it goes away and doesn't end up in your compost or anybody else's compost. And then again, um, and you can use fungicide to prevent. Um, okay, next slide. Rust. Rust is not, you know, just, you, don't always, you don't always see rust on roses. I actually have it in my yard on my hypericum, which is St. John's wort, and it's really tough to get rid of. If you look on the underside of the leaf, you'll actually see these, this rust looking uh, fungus, and it prefers cold uh, weather, moist weather. You see it in the coast, but also if your, your roses are under shade, they're not getting sun, that can be part of the problem. Um, you have to be very diligent, dil just diligent about um, trying to prevent it. Avoid again over watering, overhead watering like sprinkler overhead watering. Um, drip is always better. Prune back severely if you need to, and then dispose of all the leaves and the fungicide um, more for prevention than to actually get rid of it. So the moment you notice it, or just again being conscious of where you're going to put your rose will really help to prevent it from happening. Next slide. Rose mosaic, it's actually, this is a, a virus and it actually is a combination of several viruses. Um, it's often seen when roses are being propagated or they're being grafted. It could be in a rootstock and then it's grafted. Um, and then that, that rose may uh, be asymptomatic, may not even show the, the virus and have the virus, or it may have the actual virus. Um, and then you'll see this breaking up of the color. Uh, and on, unfortunately, you really can't get rid of it once you have it, it's kind of there. There's nothing you can spray on it. You may just have to remove the infected plant if the leaves are distorted or twisted um, over time. So if, uh, and it's not uncommon to have rose mosaic in small, uh, little miniature roses. So you wanna be, if you're gonna buy one, you wanna really look at it and make sure you don't see signs of this. Next slide. Let's talk about insects and pests. There's good ones and there's bad ones. Um, and you wanna invite the good ones and you wanna try to get rid of the bad ones. So aphids tend, tend to be the bad one. We probably all are familiar with aphids. Um, I have them in my yard. Uh, the nice thing about aphids is you can get rid of them with just spraying them, hardy spraying. They, uh, they do favor young rapid growing tissue. They, oh, we're gonna go back one more time. Go back, slide. There you go, thank you. Um, they cause that honeydew, which ants uh, love. So if you find that there's an ant going up and down, ants are going up and down your roses, you wanna look for aphids, but they're on the bottom of the leaves. Um, and, but you also want to invite the natural enemies. But again, with aphids, if you give it a hearty spray, I had them on my lint roses and literally had to spray the plant two or three times a day. It took over a week to finally get rid of the aphids. If you just leave one aphid on the plant, they will uh, multiply. They are very hardy and they will uh, multiply uh, very quickly. So you have to be pretty persistent about that. Next slide. Um, of course, besides aphids, there's other uh, insects that are pests. We're, you know, you might be familiar with Japanese beetles, rose beetles, road slugs, rose aphids, thrips, um, rose uh, leaf hoppers. Uh, but again, you can always invite and encourage beneficial insects into your garden. So definitely take uh, some time to get to know the beneficial ones like lady beetles and spiders and parasitic wasps. My favorite is the lace wing. They're quite beautiful in the garden and you just have to get in there and look around, you'll start seeing them. The um, surfeit fly also, I remember, you know, they're sometimes hard to identify, but spend a little time and get, to get, to get familiar with your beneficials. One way to get familiar with those and encourage them is to plant things that they like. So in your garden, when you have roses, you can always plant um, petunias or marigolds or lavender, um, geraniums, they all invite uh, beneficial insects if you like herbs, um, parsley, thyme, lavender, catnip, even um, salvia, they invite beneficials. So you can do a combination in your garden of roses and then your um, 
your companion plants that then encourage all these uh, great friends that we want to have, these insects that will do the job of getting rid of um, the, um, the bad guys. Because we want to try to stay away from pesticides, insecticidals, soaps uh, can be used, but we want to try to stay away from it if we can, because if you use, in, if you use insecticidal soap, it also will kill some of the beneficial insects. So there's really that balance in the garden of tolerating some damage, encouraging the good insects and enjoying the flora and the fauna and the vegetables and the fruit if you have that. Next slide. This is my granddaughter, Reese. I always uh, um, make sure that I teach my grandkids to stop and smell the roses. So this, she's just reminding us that with all the hard work and energy and time that we put into taking care of our roses, that we need to also stop and smell them and enjoy them um, because they do, us, do bring us such joy just in the beauty, but also the fragrance that they provide. All right, thank you, Deborah and Suzanne. Oh, that was that was really uh, very informative. So we have a couple of questions, uh, but not too many uh, so far. So please feel free to add a question to the um, to the chat if there's anything else that you think you'd like to know and hasn't come about yet. Um, so one of our first things was um, about pruning a uh, tree rose. So on a single stalk, do you still go for that base shape or do you go with something else? Yes. Um, so you still want that open growth, um, but obviously you're doing it on a much longer stem. But yes, the same concept. You're, um, you can have a little more upward growth because um, what I try to do is have um, the lateral branches. So um, if your branches are perpendicular, um, they tend not to bloom as much, but they'll send off side shoots um, that will, will curve upwards and those will bloom. So you can have um, more of a tree shape for a tree rose, but you still want to make sure you've got that aeration so that you don't have all the growth um, in the center. Uh, with roses, the whole concept is just to keep enough space between the branches that you don't have all those diseases. And I'm going to full disclosure here, I have every one of the major diseases <laughs> that Deborah discussed <laughs> on my roses. And I know I'm not going to get rid of them, but I try to keep them suppressed. Uh, and that's the best I can do because um, at least in, in, in my area, they're, they're never going away. Yeah, I think that's, that's a good point that Suzanne makes is that um, you do the best at pruning and cut. It's a little bit like when you cut your hair and you go, oh, I don't think I like what that looks like, but it's going to grow back. And with roses too, you practice it and you play with it and you, you, you get the pruning down and the shape down and, and um, come in, come and do some pruning on Saturday and you'll see um, all the different variety of ways to prune and um, rarely are you going to kill it by pruning. If anything, it's going to love you for it. All righty. And sorry, real quick, the uh, other thing okay. I'll say about my experience with tree roses is that they, because you're restricting their growth, they tend to sucker more. So you want to be sure to get to those suckers pretty quickly. Yeah. Good right. point. Yeah. Good point. All right. Um, let's see. Uh, someone would like to know if you have recommendations on where get you could get uh, the beneficial insect if you were to. Oh, well, you know, honestly, you, you invite them by having, you bring plants in that they like. Um, I have to say, I go to ACE annually. I buy thousands of little, little house for them and then they take it personal, but they go somewhere and hopefully they go to somebody's garden. Um, but I'm always bringing in ladybugs. Um, you can bring in others as well. But if you don't have the plants that where they can thrive and grow, then they won't stick around. And so um, I definitely try to get better at having them in my the the beneficial um, the 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 companion plants 
in my garden and it's gotten to be very fun and I and I think also at the state park I want to do more planting companion plants with the roses so that they'll invite and have those um, those insects you really just kind of have to invite them in make it make it cozy for them <laughs> make them want to stay make them all right stay. yeah um do you know anything about rose rosette disease not offhand suzanne um are they talking about the mouth formed where you get the green growth within the rose uh, within the flower so you get um, sort of leaves that grow within the so uh let's see that was patty if you have you know if you have something you want to add to clarify that go ahead and pop that in the in the chat and we'll see if we can yeah because i think i think i i know what suzanne's talking about and that's just something that's a yeah, yeah, that tends to be from trauma or from freezing or from some kind of environmental, you know, so in Arizona, too hot, too early, um, got they got dry, it, it, it damaged the bud, and you get this weird little, where it gets confused about whether it's a leaf or a flower. Right. And you just get this malformed flower. Right. Yeah. So it's and, and you can, I mean, it. And that, as I say, and it's usually not a problem with the rose itself. It's just the conditions at that time. Right. So they call it, they're called uh, what? Um, herbotic, right? Is that right, Susan? Herbotic. Sorry, I'm having Where trouble hearing you. Oh, so it's a like Suzanne's saying it's the environmental management of the chemicals that are being used, or the soil, or exposure. Is that right? Yeah, and for what I've seen, it tends to be. Um, so a weather event that hit them right at the wrong time. But it could also okay. be, yes, a stress that you did with chemical, it, the plant got salt or some something that that's traumatized the, the blossoms. Yeah, yeah. Right. I, yeah. Good, all right. It looks like that was what Patty was talking about. So good, got the right direction there. We went the right direction. All right, um, let's see, a climbing rose that needs pruning. Anything different from what you mentioned? Anything specific on those? Yeah, so climbing roses, um, I like to think of as um, sort of each branch is the rose. Well, there, there, there's tr a traditional way to do climbing roses, and I, it, probably if you got to come on Saturday, we could discuss this because um, the British do these beautiful fans, and other people I'm sure succeed at doing this as well. I don't, um, so I get my, I let the stems grow. And then I let it branch off of those stems and I just keep it tied up and I, I try to go for length, but I don't have that beautiful symmetry. Um, and so I do essentially what you would do with uh, the same branch, that stem, um, as you would cutting a, a floribund. So you're going to prune back the side shoots um, to an outer bud or just uh, if it's a floor bund I mean and, and different variety so you kind of, I didn't if you have a that only these are those very old-fashioned roses you don't want to do a winter pruning you want to prune it after it blooms so that's the one rose that's the exception and sometimes climbers are those roses um, but otherwise Yes, you're just trying to reduce the total volume uh, down by half or a third, and you're cutting off those side branches and everything that looks uh, twiggy, that, that isn't strong growth. Yeah, and we have a couple of lines at the park, and one is on a fence that um, we can talk about and, and, and talk about pruning it back. And then I, there's another one that just, just goes crazy, and I, I feel like I beat it back every year trying to contain it. So we can definitely talk about that on Saturday. Okay, all right. Um, and I think, uh, Deborah, you mentioned that there were quite a lot of old roses that, that, that will be available on, at the pruning class, right? Is that? Yeah, there's, there's roses that have been there for almost 40 years. Now, I have to say, because they haven't been watered consistently or fertilized and the pruning seems to be helpful. I, and again, some of them are under, um, 
trees or they're shaded so they're they're really struggling um definitely you get a chance to 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 look at what do you do with something is woody and um and how do you want to prune it and they'll give you a, you can have at it and we'll talk about it and and you'll get a sense of okay if i had a really old rose what do you want to do with it there's also some very young roses there as well that we can look at and um, practice on Oh, a nice variety then. All right. Is it too late to order roses um, and plant them? Uh, they were specifically mentioning David Austin and looking at, especially at container roses and climbing roses. It would be too late to, to or I personally wouldn't plant a bare rooted rose this late um, because it's likely that it's been somewhere bare rooted in less than ideal conditions for a while and getting to you, it's gonna be less than ideal conditions. Um, but if it's in a pot, if you get it with you know soil, then you can plant roses any time of year um, that are in a pot. Great, all right. Um, Deborah, you were talking a little bit about companion plants. How close do they need to be to the roses? Well, be yeah. helpful. Yeah, so you want to, again, kind of go back to what Suzanne and I were talking about is, you know, you want good airflow, so you wouldn't want it to grow into another, into a rose, you, you don't, you know, you want to pay attention to how far apart you want your roses and certainly your companion plants, if you're putting things in pots, that's kind of nice because you can rearrange those. But you definitely want to pay attention to what how big that plant is going to get a lavender can get quite big. So, um, so it doesn't have to be right next up, right, right up next to the rose. It can just be close by. Um, I have a collection of lavenders where I live because I have deer and deer don't like lavender. And so um, when they get too big, I, I, you can always cut them back and, and I can't know, move them, but you can certainly cut them back. So just again, I like to, to use the different plants like that, that complement each other and prune as needed. Um, sometimes I get carried away in too many and I have to move something, which as a master gardener, I thought was a no-no, but I found that you can move whatever you want. <laughs> move it to another end of the yard if it's happier there. Uh, so play with that and um, always pay attention though to how big the plant is and the instructions on how deep to make it go because you definitely want to be sure that you're not disrupting the roots of other plants or that you have as well. Make room for everybody. There you go. All right. Um, so there's a question about um, pruning a floribunda tree rose. Specific on that? Yeah, well, so floribunds, there are, just say there are schools of thought on floribunds. So people have different ideas of how to, how to prune floribunds. And um, if you're happy with the size, um, you can really just take back anything that's twiggy um, and leave the, the structure, reducing it by about a quarter. Um, and literally doing that by just cutting out some of those, um, the last little branching bits. Um, if you think about it like a tree, it's, it's you're leaving um, that main stem off the trunk uh, and leaving four or five little branches there. Unfortunately, this is much better to do in demonstration. Um, and as I say, and always just taking away the twiggy, the weak growth. Um, but you can leave more if you're looking for a fuller growth, you'll get smaller flowers, but it's a floribund, so you're gonna get a ton of them. And so if you're looking for those, you know, like kind of picture perfect roses, you cut back more. All righty. All right, um, Sally, I will go to that uh, pruning slide again, uh, or I'll try to get to it in a minute. But also, um, everybody will be receiving this whole slide deck, <clears throat> excuse me, through their email. So you'll have access to all of the all of the slides as well as the recording uh, that'll come in a few days here. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna go on with our questions and then I'll see if I can find that for you. All right. <clears throat> oh, this sounds lovely. Um, Julie says, my spicy smelling white cluster rose tends to have outer pe petals go brown on the edges. Any way to prevent that? Um, so 
I have the hardest time with my white and red roses. So my red roses tend to fade or darken on the outer petals, making them not as attractive. And the white ones can do just that, depending on the variety. Um, sometimes it's uh, exacerbated if it's too warm. That's depending on where you live. So in, in my Arizona days, that happened all the time. Um, here, I have more mild conditions, so it doesn't happen as often. But I would make sure that the water was consistent. Um, and if, uh, if the plant is otherwise looking great and it's sending out tons of blossoms, then unfortunately that's just the way that rose is. And that I, is true. There are red roses that will hold their color. There are white roses that will kind of yellow. The red roses will fade. And depending on the rose, you just have to live with it. If you love the, the smell otherwise and you love the rose, um, try a little extra water, and if that doesn't help, I, I don't have any good suggestions. You know, I think Susan, Susan talks, you know, that, that's a good point. So when you want to purchase roses, you might want to do a little research on that plant and the, the details of, you know, not only is, is, the, is that particular cultivar disease resistant for your area, whether that's, um, you know, particular um, issues or concerns and then again always location and water and fertilizer but also the plant itself um, whether you're going to get a hardy one that's going to bloom several times a year or you're just going to get it you're just going to get what you're going to get and it's not going to be a long bloom all right okay so um we have one more question um about uh whether queen anne's lace is a good companion plant and uh I think that uh, if it should be kept from touching the rose plants, if it was nearby. Um, uh, that's an that's an interesting one because I was looking at. Um, I, you know, herbs and other uh, aromatic plants are great rose companions, and I would actually look that one up. Queen Anne's is, that's a beautiful bush. Um, it can get kind of big. So it's, for me, it would be a landscaping question of how big that Queen Anne's is going to get and then how big your rose is and how you're going to compete. Do you want the Queen Anne's in the background or in the front or can you prune it so that they, you have three different layers, you know, of, of some plants in the front and the middle or a little higher and then something in the back. So you can always try it um, and see what you like. It's kind of like a lavender. It's going to grow. It's going to be a little bushy and thick um, where you might want to go with smaller plants. Um, marigolds are great, but they don't always, the colors don't always go with the different colors of roses. So you wouldn't necessarily use that, but geraniums might. So I tend, tend to like to go with plants that, um, you know, pests that, that drive away things like other, you know, like mosquitoes and cabbage worms. But that one would be quite lovely with roses. I don't know. What do you think, Suzanne? Um, so I would say if it, I'm a big, if you have the space, trial and error. Um, I, you, in general, don't want stuff to actually be growing into the rose. So if it's just touching a little bit, but there's still good air circulation, that's fine. But if it's really growing within the rose and particularly, competing for the root system as well you you really don't want to have that and you want and so things with superficial roots since roses have slightly deeper roots are good choices and um experiment is my best because as deb says you can dig it out and move it if you have to and you can prune it back yes and prune it back yeah. and and you can keep your roses small so you can prune roses very hard um you might um, for something like a grandiflora, if you prune those back really hard, you'll reduce their flowering because they want to be big and they'll put a lot of that effort into growing uh, leaves and, and stems. Um, but for most other roses, you can prune them pretty hard and still get good flowers. Yeah, we have shrubs. There's just one part of the park that has just shrubs, roses uh, that surround this one area. And we just prune them back hard. Yeah hard and they come back beautiful and hardy every year. I'm always amazed. I always think that, oh my God, I've killed it. And nope, nope. It's just so you can pick and choose 
what your design is and what you like and the color and any companion um, plant. Just it's all about location and spacing and water and fertilizer. <laughs> all right. Um, that is all the questions that we have now in case unless anybody has something coming in really quick. <clears throat> Excuse me. Do we want to talk about references, um, Denise? Resources? Um, yeah, we're going to move on if, if we've got all of our questions here. Um, all right, so um, we're a, it, it is coming, Deb. Not to worry here. So um, just a couple of things here as we as we head on uh, toward the end of this here, um, and that is um, we have an evaluation um, survey that um, will get to you. Uh, it'll come in the email that you'll get in the next couple of days. Um, we're having a little bit of trouble right now with our link right here. So um, we'll make sure that the correct one is in there when, uh, when we send that out in a day or two with the, um, with the slides and the link to the recording. Oh, whoops, there we go. Wow, Whoa. that's what I get for that. Whoa, <laughs> sorry about that. That was me just getting a little carried away there. Um, <laughs> all right, um, so the, the gals have mentioned a couple of times today about, um, I'm gonna scoot through this as fast as I can here, um, about uh, the classes coming up. Um, in addition to both of the, there are two classes, both a morning and an afternoon session um, at San Juan Batista Park, um, the State Historic Park there. Um, uh, this Saturday about pruning uh, roses and there's space in both of them, but the classes are filling up very quickly. One of them in particular is very close to being full because we do have a, a limit on that. Uh, but if you're interested, go ahead and, and get over there to our site. Uh, and that is at, let me go ahead and, and put this one actually into the chat here. Um, uh, so that you can go ahead and look at that. We also have, um, the uh there's just down at the bottom you can see a quick little mention about a fruit tree pruning um and we also have two classes coming up um at the uh at the uh, san juan batista state historic park also um with plant, uh, pruning fruit trees on march 11th so um take a look at what we've got over there we've got some good classes coming up for you in the uh, very new near future all right. Um, also, if you have additional questions, and I saw there was one really quick, I'll, I may throw that back out in here in a minute um, in our chat, but um, we have our hotline available to everyone too. We have master gardeners who are, I'd say waiting by the phone, but that, that sounds a little bit like um, NPR things or whatever, trying to get you to do something there. But really we, our master gardeners are right there, uh, ready to answer your, um, questions about gardening. So if you've got something specific, and I think Deb also mentioned that um, if you were uh, coming to the classes on uh, on the Saturday that you could bring, um, you know, examples of your roses, if you had, you know, uh, something you were wondering what, the, you know, if there was a disease or something on it, but please to bring them bagged so that we don't spread it anywhere, but you could bring that along. But also our, uh, our gardeners will look things up for you if you want to contact us on the hotline and uh, and get you some information on all kinds of things. And then Deborah mentioned that we have quite a few um, references here. Um, there are very specific ones. I don't know, Deb, did you have anything specific about uh, any of these you wanted to point out? You know, I think they all provide some a resource. And so always want to encourage anyone that if they have questions, they can go to these sites and just put in a specific thing that you're looking for and you'll get a cornucopia of uh, just resources to look at. So I think it's just a good go-to in case you're looking for an answer. There we go. And that'll be coming to you with the rest of the slide deck too. So you don't have to quickly write everything down this very second. It's all, it'll all be right there in your inbox in a couple of days. Um, and the one other question that we that came up, just let me get that really quickly, was just about fertilizer and does it expire? And honestly, I don't know the answer to that. I think that depends on the type of fertilizer and its storage conditions. Oops. Yes. 
Yes. Right. So um, because some will break down and give off the nitrogen that so yeah so the answer would just be it, it you kind of have to look each one up individually and find out the optimal storage conditions usually things last longer than um you know an outdate that they put on them um but uh dry fertilizer as far as i know is very stable um and i would have to look up a specific one you know, to see if you know if you're storing it at 110 degrees in Arizona, um, everything degrades. <laughs> That's a whole nother class. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Very much so. All right. All right. Well, I think I, I'm, I've learned a lot about roses. I hope everyone else has as well. Um, and I hope that we'll be able to see some of you this weekend um, at our other classes. But make sure to take a look at that. And I'd like to thank Deborah and Suzanne for a great class and everybody for being here today. So thank you very much. Thank you.